Good afternoon and welcome to Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, we uh, are here to talk about DPC and, and how it can be an impact in the Medicaid program. My name is David Bellot. I'm the director of the Right on Healthcare campaign with the foundation. And if you'd like to learn more about our efforts, you can go to texaspolicy.com slash ROH. Uh, well, why are we here today? Uh, as we look at the Medicaid program, uh, the sad truth is that far too many enrollees are, are getting their care in the ER and ER utilization has increased, and many more forego their care altogether. That's certainly not the intent of why Medicaid exists. Uh, I think everyone would agree that the goal is to get those for whom the program was, was intended uh, access to the healthcare services and not just an insurance card. And that's demonstrative of the fact that coverage is not care. Uh, so let's talk about care. That's, that's really the purpose of today. Let's talk about healthcare uh, and for those that really need it. Uh, the two panelists with us today have been proponents of healthcare delivery model called direct primary care. And both of them are seeking to introduce this model into Texas Medicaid, into the Texas Medicaid program and really bring it to the forefront as to how we can uh, impact and change healthcare for the better. Uh, so today, as we, before I introduce our guest, I wanna extend to our, our uh, folks that are watching, uh, please submit any questions you might have as, as we go through the, the live cast so that we can address them towards the end. Our first panelist today, uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Uh, thank you for, for being here, sir. Uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw is a sixth generation Texan, retired as a Lieutenant Commander after serving 10 years as a Navy SEAL. He was honored by receiving two Bronze Stars, one with Valor, the Purple Heart and the Navy Com Commendation Medal with Valor, among others. Uh, he's a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and he was elected to represent the people of the Texas second uh, congressional district. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, Representative Matt Shaheen serves the citizens of District 66 in the Texas House of Representatives, representing West Plano and North Dallas. He serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means and Vice Chair of the House Urban Affairs Committee. He's formerly a member of the Collins County Commissioner's Court, uh, representing the citizens of Precinct 1. And he's a native of Virginia, but he got to Texas as, as soon as he could. Uh, and he holds a master's degree from SMU. Gentlemen, Thank you both for what you do and uh, for uh, the communities that you serve. Before we talk about how we can help the Medicaid programs, let's talk about what is direct primary care. And Representative Shaheen, this is uh, you're introducing a bill. Yeah. What, what is your experience with direct primary care, and, and why do you think this is something that that's positive for the delivery? Well, I mean, it's a great opportunity for the state of Texas, and thank you for having me on here. And it's great to be with the congressman as well. It's really a great opportunity for the um, for Texas to really to improve the care, especially for our needy population in the state of, state of Texas. It really makes it a lot more efficient. Just improves not only the quality of care, but improves the access to care. Both of those are significant problems in not only just the state of Texas, but really across the nation. So what we're looking at is a, a model where we actually have a direct relationship with that physician. And so that's the most important thing, obviously, when we're having our health care addressed and any, any kind of health issues is that direct relationship with the physician. And it actually removes that insurance barrier, if you will. If you see that there's a lot of physicians now, more and more want to go to this type of model as well. It's just more efficient to them, less bureauc bureauc bureaucracy, and it just improves that relationship. So it's a great avenue in the state of Texas to prove access and uh, improve physicians' choice as well. Congressman Crenshaw, I know that on your podcast and and um, in, in many of the things that you've you've done interviews for, you've spoken a lot about direct primary care, and you have many physicians that you consult with that are direct primary care physicians. I, tell us a little bit about your experience, and I'd also uh, you said something to me in your office once, and you talked about how uh, that's been a longstanding practice in the halls of Congress. Yeah, yeah, I was about to bring that up actually. Um, you know, they don't call it direct primary care, but that's exactly what members of Congress get. Uh, they, we, we're, we're told when we show up, you know, we're checking in, it's like going to college and uh, you're a freshman and you've got your freshman class and you're going through all your, your check-ins and you choose your office and they say, um, you know, here's, here's what we provide here at the house. And, and the, if you want, if you want access to the house doctor, um, I think it's about $600 a year total and, um, and then you get total access to the doctor. Well, that's just direct primary care. That's exactly what that is. 
so that, you know, they don't call it that, but that's exactly what it is. And so if members, if it's good enough for members of Congress, it should be good enough uh, for everybody. And, you know, this shouldn't be that partisan. Um, there, there is some Democrat support. Once you explain this to Democrats, uh, it's it, it does catch on a little bit. Um, and, I, and I say a little bit because there's there's still a very good portion of Democrats that are that are uh, all about complete government takeover of health care. Um, and if that's your end goal, then direct primary care uh, is, is is an off road from that. So, you know, because it is free market based. So that that is that is a problem, um, but but it's good to remind them that uh, yeah this is this is what we actually use. It's a great model. Yeah, and the other well, it's mutually exclusive. Direct primary care and government uh, uh, insurance or government takeover of healthcare is, is it just doesn't work because uh, the principle behind the model itself is that they're third party free. They want not only a, a clinical relationship with the patient but a financial one as well. Right, and that really uh, fosters that that their ability to work together uh, and with patient having skin in the game, uh, there's the ability for them to, to really value the service that they're receiving from that position and the relationship that they have at that time. Yeah. Representative Shaheen, you're, you're looking to introduce a bill yeah. that will uh, really benefit uh, Medicaid enrollees by giving them access to direct primary care. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, so we're talking about this model, very, very efficient creates opportunities to uh, expand access to care and improve care. And uh, we are looking at doing a pilot. Uh, we've already drafted the legisl legislation. And so we'll have an opportunity to actually pilot this in different areas of the state of Texas. It'll be, you know, a combination of some of your larger and, and, and counties, some of your smaller counties. So we can get a good look at how this pilot will work. And what it'll do is it'll open up the door with respect to seeing, you know, what kind of adjustments that we need to make so that we can roll this out statewide for our needy population. But all these benefits uh, will be available to our uh, to our citizens, to our needy citizens in the state of state of Texas. And if you just think about it, the government, the state government spends tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars on just these transactions dealing with the insurance companies and, and that type of stuff. Can you imagine being able at some point in time to be able to remove all that? Just think what the experience will be for that individual that needs that health care. They don't have to deal with the state. They don't have to deal with the insurance company. They're dealing directly with that position. It's really a phenomenal model. I'm really excited. And then there's some downstream effects as well, right? If we have you know, several million people ultimately in the state of Texas that, stop, that start shopping for their health care, for their physician, we do couple this with like some price transparency, those types of things. Every day, Texans are going to see price reductions eventually because of those free market forces. So that's the piece of legislation that we'll file in, uh, in January of next year. And, and going back to what I originally said in the introduction, so many of, of the Medicaid beneficiaries are, are seeking care at the emergency room. Why yeah. is that? Well, we have so many, only so many physicians that are uh, enrolled in the program itself. So uh, you have a limited number of those that, that can care for those people. So the wait times are, are extensive. Mm -hmm. um, you also have difficulty with transportation or childcare. The benefit of a direct primary care physician is that they have access to them not only in person or, and not only being able to get to their office uh, relatively quickly for an extended period of time, but through telemedicine. And we've seen the real benefit of telemedicine uh, here, especially in the last six months. Um, Congressman Crenshaw, you, you actually uh, just recently dropped a bill that uh, would... Uh, support this kind of effort by Representative Shaheen. One of the, the obstacles uh, for, for us here in the States is the ability to get waivers to be creative with these kinds of pilots. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've done there in Congress? Sure, so uh, the bill that we just introduced, and we've been working on this for a long time, and uh, it, the, the hard part about, I think, effective bills in Congress, it's easy to put a messaging bill out, right? Because I think we all sort of envision a premium support model, just generally speaking in healthcare. And, and part of that support for the poor would be, you know, putting, uh, you know, putting the, the, the fees that would have required for direct primary care into an HSA. And it is, it's a very simple uh, solution, but getting to that simple solution is extremely complicated. And so we didn't want to put out just the utopian messaging bill. Uh, we wanted to we wanted to have a first step that is reasonable and, and incremental. And so 
my bill, the Direct Primary Care for America Act, <coughs> is, is just that, right? It's it's incremental. It's it's common sense. It shouldn't be very uh, controversial. There's multiple elements to it. You mentioned one, which is simply allow the states to experiment, okay, through an 1115 waiver, uh, including direct primary care as, as part of Medicaid benefits. So that allows uh, Texas to experiment with, with, with that and use Medicaid funding that already exists uh, to push more towards a direct primary care avenue. Now, now remember, a part of the goal here is to simply expand the use of direct primary care. Our goal is to normalize this practice. Once you normalize the practice, I think it becomes more inevitable as, as America's solution for, for that first step in healthcare, which is primary care. You know, we acknowledge it, this is not solving insurance uh, and, and people's coverage. It's not meant to, but it does make it much easier to solve coverage. Why? Because what we find is when you use direct primary care, it, we see this in the Houston area quite often, uh, premiums go down because say, a, say a, a, a company that contracts with the DPC renegotiates their premiums and they get everybody saves money as a result. And everybody feels like they actually have access to a doctor that they know that they trust. And every time they go see that doctor, there's no extra co-pays, there's no deductibles, they're not worrying about all that. So it's just, it works really well for everybody. It's an avenue to solve further problems down the line. Okay, so what else does it do? How do we else do we expand this? Well, very simple. We allow HSAs to actually pay for it. Okay, it's simple. Right now your HSA can't even pay a direct primary care physician, which is nonsense, it should be able to. Along those same lines, if you're a Medicare beneficiary, we allow you to purchase DPC through your MSA if you have a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, if you wanna practice direct primary care in a rural area, uh, we also have provision where we say, well, let's make you eligible to uh, pay your medical school loans through changes to the National Health Service Corps. Um, also uh, HRAs, um, again, it's, which is another form of an HSA, but just given through your employer. So allowing these existing, um, um, you know, savings accounts, uh, tax deductible savings accounts to pay for DPC uh, fees. Um, it's just a first step, right? And then that's the next step and then it's the next step. So we're, we're excited about this. Yeah. You know, primary care is, is it, we've seen a, a departure from that really important first step. That's what you mentioned here earlier. Uh, but that's really 80% of healthcare can be handled at the primary care level. Uh, whenever we talk uh, to uh, the folks that are opposing uh, these kinds of models, they always focus on these catastrophic uh, big item issues. And that, that is what insurance is appropriate for. We, we want to be able to, to address those things with proper insurance or true insurance, which is uh, not quite what we have today. But your primary care physician should and, and usually will be able to take care of many issues to include chronic conditions. Representative Shaheen, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about having uh, this be available in different parts of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see in your district um, people having difficulty accessing physicians? Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, especially if we want to talk about the needy population, right? You have upwards of over 70% of doctors that won't even uh, accept Medicaid patients right now. And so, and then your choices, right? Even if you're not needy in the state of Texas and you're going through an insurance company, you know, you've got that list of doctors that only you can go to. So your shopping is really limited. In fact, my doc, my, uh, my middle daughter, Abby, has to have uh, uh, some surgery on her jaw. And uh, she's very limited to the number of doctors. And it's a $20,000 surgery. And, um, you know, we just don't have a lot of choice. So what choices? So one of the other things that I'm really excited about this DPC model is just the amount of choice that it opens up. And, you know, the congressman really had a good point. This is kind of the starting point and we're not going to eliminate insurance. Um, you know, they can be coupled, but what it does do is over time, it's going to just create additional opportunities, uh, additional choices and those types of things uh, for individuals. But yeah. And the other thing is, you know, a lot of insurance companies actually left the state of Texas a number of years ago. And so again, just that difficulty of finding the doctor and it's really devastating to an individual if they have that relationship with their doctor and then they lose that doctor, if they yeah. change insurance, that type of stuff, that relationship, especially as you get older, is really important. So yeah, 
we've got a challenge, and I think the DPC model will really address as far as your choice of, uh, of doctors in the community. Yeah, Congressman Crenshaw, you mentioned that DPC or direct primary care is not insurance. In the state of Texas, uh, actually, Representative uh, Bonin, who happens to be a physician, uh, passed a bill that, that clearly delineated that, that DPC is not insurance. Unfortunately, that's not the understanding of the IRS uh, at the federal level. They, they still want to maintain that direct primary care is a form of coverage. Uh, and you very explicitly in your bill say, try to make the, the claim that uh, it is not insurance. It is a form of care. Uh, I wanted you to touch on that, but I also want to uh, get your feedback or get your, your, your thinking on, on why are, are those that are opposed to DPC, uh, opposed to DPC? Uh, Typically, the challenge that I hear is that, well, it's just concierge medicine for rich people. And we just know that to not be true. Yeah. Well, to your point on the IRS, uh, frankly, you explained it uh, just fine. It's really not much more complicated than that. Uh, we, just, we, we just need to change a couple of things. That's a, and that's what this bill does. It's, we're, we're, set, we're setting up that first step. Okay, let's, let's, let's put it into the regulatory framework that this is even allowed. Okay, so like that, that's the first step. It, it's... I wish, I wish we could go beyond that um, right away, but it's, it's amazing how controversial this gets. It doesn't make sense. Um, and that was your next question, right? Like, wh why would anybody be against this? And look, you know, the, the counter argument you'll hear is, okay, well, what if I get a broken leg? What if I get cancer? This doesn't help me with that. And we're like, we didn't say it would. That, that's, that's not the point, right? We're, we're solving this uh, like rational thinkers. We're, we're solving this in an adult fashion, which means you have to take steps, incremental steps. And, uh, you know, healthcare um, has multiple phases to it. One is that primary care element, uh, which is your introduction um, in, into the system, right? And with the primary care physician that you trust, that's what DPC is solving. Um, then it's then it's I would call it you know intermediate um, in insurance you know a broken leg a, a temporary illness and then there's your catastrophic illnesses and pre-existing conditions and you need you need to approach each of those phases differently in, in my opinion and or my point about DPC is that it makes it easier to approach those second and third phases because well you're engaging in preventative medicine you're actually again with, with when that relationship exists between a doctor and a patient, uh, that doctor can monitor that patient, that doctor can help assist that patient with, with what, what's the right insurance that they should buy, what's most appropriate for them, uh, what kind of specialists should they see, um, what should you be eating, what should you be, you know, what does your sleep look like, Th these kind of things, the basics that most Americans just don't have uh, when it comes to that relationship. And, and they don't know what to do. So they tend to go to an emergency room, which costs a lot of money. And if they just don't want to pay it, then they just don't pay it. And the hospital eats that bill. And then charges our, our insurance, um, our, our people, our payers actually more on the back end, which rides it, which re re increases all of our premiums. All of this stuff is connected. And so the, the, it's, it's overly simplistic when, when the left suggests that well, you, you can't do this because it doesn't solve all the problems. I didn't say it solved all the problems, but it certainly helps us solve all the problems and you need to be more open-minded about it. And the, you know, the only, the only forces that actually reduce prices and increase quality are free market forces. Government forces never do this. Um, they might make it more affordable, although that's actually, um, that's debatable since more affordable uh, is paid for by higher taxes. So it's, it's unclear that it's actually more affordable. Um, and it certainly reduces quality uh, in the, you know, and it certainly reduces supply of medicine, supply of innovation, supply of doctors, supply of hospital beds. And, and if, you know, believe me, you can just look to comparisons with Canada and the UK. So um, that, that's a complicated answer, I suppose. But if you're, if you're dead set on, gov on pure government control of healthcare, then direct primary care is your enemy because it is it is a it is a free market approach, but it's a compassionate free market approach. It you know it, the, the fact that we're looking for Medicaid waivers at least as that first step is indicative of the fact that we we understand that not even if, even seventy five bucks a month is too expensive for some people. I understand that. Um, let's use our existing mechanisms to to subsidize that care and therefore expand these on the supply side of, of DPC, encourage more doctors to get into this. 
yeah. into this model. Um, this is the last thing I'll mention. You know, a lot of doctors in med school say it's 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 just not profitable. It's not reasonable for them to get into primary care. Uh, they're they're not going to be able to pay back their med school bills uh, doing that. And this model changes that. It is profitable and it does allow you to go back to your rural community or your low income community where you always wanted to be the town doctor um, and, uh, and, and practice what you wanted to do. So it's, 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 it's really a win-win. Yeah. And, and people would say, well, how is it possible for 60 to $80 a month uh, seeing patients for, for much longer than you normally would? How can that possibly be profitable? I can tell you that in the traditional insurance model, 40% of the overhead for, for physicians and, and many other uh, healthcare organizations is attributed to uh, the business related to having to collect from the insurance company. Mm -hmm. So they can do things for, for a much more affordable rate if they eliminate those middlemen. Yeah. So one thing that I, I found fascinating is, you know, we have our, uh, a private uh, Facebook group for Right On Healthcare. And we have a number of direct primary care physicians in that group. And one thing that, that I see again and again and again, and I think both of you have mentioned, it's not just the services that they provide, but it's the downstream services that, that benefit the patient financially. Uh, they find them uh, more affordable imaging services. They find them more affordable lab services. They find them more affordable surgical uh, services. Uh, usually the savings far exceed uh, the membership rates for the direct primary car, the primary care physician. They, they normally, uh, I would say more times than not, uh, end up being uh, a cost savings beyond what uh, the right. patient has to pay for the direct primary care physician. And I was going to say, you know, there's, there's a future we can imagine too where insurance companies really start to start to encourage the use of DPC. Um, I, I, you know, it, it would make sense to me that as an insurance company, you'd want, uh, you, you'd rather be paying for your uh, clients to be using DPC than you would a multi-thousand dollar uh, emergency room bill, you know, because that's just where they end up. So, you, you know, you, we, we should imagine a future, I would hope, where insurance companies are really pushing this as well. This, this is one of these unique healthcare policy issue areas where there's not a good reason for a lot of the different sectors to be against it. So usually anytime you propose something, you're gonna pit people against each other in the healthcare sectors. And uh, it's, it's interesting to watch how that happens, but I would think DPC would be something that everybody can agree on. Um, well, hopefully that's the case. Representative Shaheen, yeah. so I, I'll, I'll throw out the same question. As far as the opposition, what have you heard from those uh, that have said, you know, this, this, this won't work or this isn't yeah. a good idea? You know, there's just a there's a hesitancy, um, unfortunately, in the state legislature of any kind of significant change like this. And this is a significant departure from from uh, the, the current model. I think some of it is, though, people just don't really understand the concept. Or I was talking to one legislator on the floor and they were saying, oh, this is just a way to make doctors even more rich. And, and it's just that type of attitude. But I think as a state, right, if we can just focus on improving access, improving care, expanding choices, and really just focus on that, I think we'll move the ball. It's just the normal resistance that you get to any kind of change like this. Everybody has that, you know, that insurance mentality, that type of stuff. And it's just the, the funny thing is, this is the way it used to be uh, many years ago. And so we, we've shifted. And so it's really getting back to the type of process that we had um, historically. You know, I will tell you that, you know, we've talked about ERs a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing to remember is, you know, during this COVID crisis, right, we as a state, we've been monitoring our healthcare capacity. We didn't ever want, ever want to run into a situation where we were having to turn people away from the hospitals and, and what have you. And being able to divert the needy from the ER to that position, right, enables us as a state and really particularly particular parts of our state to adapt to any type of crisis, whether it's a pandemic or maybe it's a hurricane and those types of things where your, your capacity has been impacted. You know, we've been monitoring the capacity across the state of Texas to make sure we didn't get overwhelmed because of the virus. And, you know, now we're a little bit worried because of, of flu season and that type of stuff. So again, there's always this issue about, do you have enough capacity if, if some kind of catastrophic event uh, occurs? And right, we have a couple of catastrophic events, it seems like 
every year in Texas with tornadoes and hurricanes. But being able to divert, you know, those um, those needy patients to that relationship, in addition to all the benefits to that to that individual, but it also helps us with our capacity in case there is some type of emergency. And that's really important for us as a state to be able to address those. Yeah. I appreciate that. Congressman Crenshaw, I know that uh, you are on a, a, a time limit with us, but uh, I do want to uh, just share a couple of questions from our audience, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, uh, first question comes um, from a, a, a listener. If Representative Crenshaw's bill passes, will Americans be able to opt out of Medicare uh, in favor of direct primary care? No, no. I mean, it's again, it's not insurance. You know, Medicare is is full coverage insurance, um, and it's for for seniors specifically. Now, now, what my bill would allow is uh, for you to use Medicare uh, 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 MRAs or MSAs to um, to actually pay for direct primary care. So, if you're beyond Medic Medicare, um, in theory, under this bill, you'd have you'd more. If you're in a Medicare Advantage program, you'd have the ability to purchase into a DPC. And again, what, why is that important? It just, because it just makes things easier. That's why, because we like DPC because it is a, is a total relationship with a doctor that doesn't involve any additional co-pays or deductibles. And um, that doctor is your quarterback. That's, that's the whole point of it. So it's no, it, it, is, it is not an either or this, um, you know, DPC is in addition to um, some form of insurance. But if, and again, it's your primary care doctor is your first step into the healthcare system. And I, and I guess, honestly, at the beginning, I don't know that we really um, explained the concept of DPC. Uh, so maybe that's, maybe that's the issue. So, you know, basically what it is, is a primary care doctor, instead of doing it the traditional way with taking insurance, they just say, I'm gonna charge you a, about on average 75 bucks a month and you have total access to me, okay? And that total access encompasses a series of services that are that are primary care related. Maybe it's lab work, um, it's checkups, it's hey you you you've got some kind of cough or some kind of symptoms, and you want to call me any time of the night. Maybe not any time of the night, but you want to call me and text me or do FaceTime, then then let's do that. And there's no additional charges. It's all included. It doesn't include necessarily specialty care, um, or or again like more catastrophic injuries. Uh, but it is your first step into the system. And, uh, and it's, again, it's, it, it exists as such right now. Uh, and the goal of my bill is to simply allow for the expansion of it. Yeah. And we're getting some, some great questions. I'll give the second one here to Representative Shaheen. Yeah. What, what is uh, the threat of doctors raising their monthly costs without market control? Yeah, well, that's the good news about this is you're actually inserting the free market, right? So the, the, pressure will be differently. Right now you have a situation where people really aren't even shopping, right? We don't even know what the price is for a lot of, a lot of the healthcare that we're receiving. This really turns that up on its, on its head. And now you actually have patients that are, that are shopping. So you're actually, at, from a free market basis, you'll actually have a downward pressure on, on pricing versus people don't even look at pricing today. And that's part of the reason why our healthcare costs are, are going up. So there's not really a lot of fear with respect to that. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the state is going to be handling literally billions and billions of dollars for these needy um, individuals. And so if anything, that coupled with the free market is actually going to be a, a downward uh, pressure on those on that pricing. Yeah. Congressman Crenshaw, this is one that I hear a lot. I'm sure you hear this as well. Uh, how many Americans can even afford an HSA? How many could be served by DPC? Right. I mean, you know, you got to look at it. It's like a gym membership. It's um, an investment in your health. And, and, and again, I think in our in the future, I think we do imagine more of a premium support model. Right. If you ask me what my ideal version of healthcare would be, it would be along the lines of premium support models where the, the money goes to the patient. If we're going to subsidize healthcare, the money should go to the patient and they should be allowed to to choose the insurance that that works for them best or choose and choose the DPC that works for them best. Uh, this is more along the lines of what Medicare Advantage is. This is why Medicare Advantage saves money. Uh, it's also why why seniors are increasingly flocking to it. They like it. Uh, it works better. So it can, because it it combines it is a, it is a essentially a public private relationship in the sense that we combine free market forces um, with with the acknowledgement that not everybody can afford these services, but we do want people to have access to them. 
Okay. And, and, if I, and if I could add to that, the, the HSA, the way I see it, it's, it's, it's a vehicle. And so whether it's the Medicaid program that's putting money into that HSA, whether it's Medicare, whether it's an employer uh, or yourself exactly. or your family members. Uh, exactly. I mean, in, in the ideal world, David, you know, my bill would, would say a, a couple of things very simply. Everybody gets his, everybody gets an HSA right now. That's just if you have a social security number, you have an HSA. That's how it should be. Um, and if you're and if you're eligible for Medicaid, you know, if you're at that income level, then instead of instead of propping up this failing system of Medicaid, you simply inject money into that HSA and allow the patient to actually choose their care, right? That, that, that's sort of the utopian vision that I think we, we have at the end, end goal of this. We're, we're not even close to that with this bill, um, but this bill at least puts us on a, on a first step that allows, uh, that allows some flexibility with, the, with existing HSAs. And then we can move on to the next step, okay? And then we can, we, it's incremental. I think it's, it's more reasonable. It's incremental, um, and it's uh, you know has it has a chance of passing. I think has a chance of getting some support. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. we'll hope so. Um, here's a good one. What what keeps a doctor from discriminating on the basis of health status when enrolling a patient? I, I think the answer uh, to our, our our audience might uh, might be surprising to some. But do any, either of you have any any response to that one? Yeah, I, I've asked doctors the same question. If you listen to my podcast, I did ask uh, ask them that same um, that 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 same question. And so far, there's not really evidence of that happening. Um, I'm reluctant to implement uh, you know additional regulations, but uh, to to deal with that. But the reality is, is you know when you when you already have measures in place to protect for pre existing conditions, this sort of um, you know must um, must issue type legislation, which is what Republicans support that, that, that effectively fixes that problem. Um, but the, the entire point of DPC too, again, is you imagine a scenario Actually, you don't have to imagine this, this already exists. You can put in your, you can go to the website, you can put in your zip code and you choose, right? You choose which doctors are available. They might have different prices too. You know, we, we say it's an average of 75 bucks a month. Um, but there might be different prices. Maybe there's different services that are offered based on those prices. And um, when, there, when there's choice in the market, um, you can find what you need. Yeah, thank you. Many physicians, and, I, and what uh, the complaint that many people give is, is uh, that's consistent with this question is they'll say, well, uh, direct primary care doctors do what they do because they're cherry picking healthy patients. Hmm. Uh, that, that has not been the case. Uh, we've looked at uh, an extensive number of practices. In fact, uh, who tends to uh, find a DPC doctor? It's usually people with chronic disease. Uh, they're getting their, their diabetes uh, monitored. They're getting a high blood pressure monitored. Uh, they're getting the attention that they can't get in a traditional uh, uh, type of clinic with, with insurance. So, um, yeah, I, it's, that's just not been the case from what I've seen and what I've read and, and looking at some of the research that's coming out. But that's that's a common uh, uh, statement that people oh. will make. That, well, they're just they're cherry picking yeah. healthy patients, so it's easy for them to uh, to do that. But um, yeah, well, it's actually, it's actually the opposite. We what we've seen, like in my county, Collin County, we have over 100 doctors mm -hmm. that um, from you know specialty to you know general practitioners. It's really across the board that they actually set aside. This over 100 doctors that set aside number of hours per week to provide health care to the needy for free. They don't. They don't even, um, you know, do the Medicaid transactions or anything like that. They just see them for free. So we're, we're actually seeing a difference. And so if you can take those doctors and introduce the the direct, direct primary care model, right? That's that's the, the whole concept there that you can actually expand the number of doctors that are seeing the needy, seeing the, the individuals with with uh, maybe some pre-existing conditions and i think the pre-existing conditions the the challenge really isn't so much with your primary physician it has more to do with some of your your upstream work your specialty doctors your surgeries those that's i think where the where the challenges are i, I don't think that's going to really be an issue with uh, direct primary care that was that's, that's the other additional part i wanted to point out um it's when you're talking about a patient that constantly needs care of a certain kind 
uh, they're not going to be discriminated against necessarily by a primary care doctor in the first place because they're not looking for primary care. They're, they they need a specific kind of specialty, and and and, and again, that's downstream. That's that's insurance that's paying for that. So I just don't I don't think this I, I understand. That's why I like this this question makes sense. But once you delve into it, it doesn't appear to be the problem that people think it might be. Yeah. No. And uh, here we are at our, our last question, and I know this is going to be. Uh, an important one for you, Representative Shane. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking, is Big Pharma fighting against DPC mm -hmm. and, and the bills? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that that's the case in Texas because Texas is one of five states that does not allow physicians to dispense medications. Yeah. Uh, they still have to do that uh, through, uh, through the pharmacy. Uh, but uh, luckily, uh, Representative Shaheen yeah. is introducing another bill to to reverse that course. Yeah, we actually, for the state of Texas, we have, actually have a package of of healthcare bills with with the intent of you know giving more control to um, our Texans and expanding access and and uh, direct primary care is a big piece of that, obviously. But we do have another piece of legislation that will allow individuals, and this is this is everybody, this is all 29 million Texans that when you go to see your physician and you need medication, you, have, you get a prescription for medication, you can actually buy that medication right there when you're in the doctor's office. You don't have to get the prescription and then go to the pharmacy and, and wait for the prescription to be filled and then actually buy it. You can actually buy it from your doctor. And you're exactly right, David. Texas is one of only five states that doesn't allow it. And what I'm really excited about uh, this piece of legislation is like direct primary care, it will drive down the cost of healthcare, right? Yeah. Because you have, you know, a physician that, you know, he or she is making their money, you know, not through med selling medication. So what they can do here is they can, you know, cover some administrative costs, but essentially sell the medication pretty much at cost. So you might buy, you know, medication from your physician for $20 or less, instead of going to the pharmacy and buying it for 200, 300, whatever the astronomical. So that one, I can tell you, we get uh, resistance, but uh, we're gonna fight through that uh, as well as all these uh, healthcare, healthcare ideas, especially around direct primary care to really do what's best for um, our needy citizens, our vulnerable citizens, like you, what you said, right? I mean, these, these systems have been put in place to take care of, of our most vulnerable and we're gonna do everything we can to take care of them. Absolutely. Well, I want to give each of you a final moment to, to share your, some of your thoughts. And uh, then I wanted to uh, just give my final parting uh, notes. But uh, Congressman Crenshaw, I'll let you go first. Sure. No, I appreciate everybody's interest in this. Um, we, we do think this is the future. There's a lot There's a lot to be excited about on this. And Republicans just in general have to take control of the health care message because we're on a dangerous path. Uh, with what the left tends to promise. You know, the, the left has this habit of promising the most radical solutions, um, but, uh, but containing those solutions in the language of compassion, right? They care the most, and that's why they have the most radical solutions. And they're very good at persuading people that there's no trade-offs with those solutions, that there's no consequences, no second and third order effects from, from a total government takeover of your health care. They, they're very good at making people believe that hey, this is just something you could have if we would just give it to you. But that's not true. There, there's, there's real consequences to this stuff. And we have to be more thoughtful uh, in our policymaking. Um, when we do have the common goal of getting Americans access to quality care, right? That, that is something I agree with the left on, right? I, I do want Americans to get access to quality health care. Uh, but I also don't want to undercut the foundations of quality that our system provides. And so we have to be more thoughtful in our solutions. And then we have to message this correct. We've got to show people that we really do have those solutions. So um, th that's why we work so hard on this. That's why I'm excited to do it. Thank you, sir. Representative Shaheen. Yeah, I mean, access to quality care is is what we're all about. And it, it's, it's, it's very fair for a, a citizen, a constituent to come to us and say, I'm worried about healthcare. I can't afford healthcare. I don't want to go to bank. I don't. Want, I don't want to declare bankruptcy because I get catastrophically ill. What's the solution? Our solution is just heavily weighed on the free market, and quite frankly, the reality of the health healthcare system. There is no way. Just looking at how complex and how big the healthcare industry is in the United States, let alone globally. I mean, it's billions and billions of dollars. To think that you can craft legislation 
to tackle a, a, a industry so complex is just, it's just not realistic. It, it, it can't be done. That's why, you know, for me, direct primary care is one of several pieces of legislation. And this is a very key part. Again, it's that patient doctor relationship. So I'm awfully yeah. excited about this. I think Republicans need to lead on this issue. We do have the answers because we're the ones that are talking to the doctors, to the hospitals to come up with these solutions, not lobbyists and bureaucrats. And so I think what you'll see is Texas leads the nation in a bunch of different areas. And I think what we're going to see is Texas is going to lead on, on health care and improving uh, quality access to care. So I'm really excited about it. And I, I really appreciate the congressman's support on this and what he's doing in Washington. Uh, thank you both, uh, because these, these are going to be important bills and we'll be watching them with great interest. Let me leave on, on, this, uh, on this message. On a weekly basis, uh, I hear, well, David, uh, this, this, what we have today is, is better than it was prior to uh, the, the law that we currently deal with. And I, I don't discount that. I don't disagree with that. Healthcare was, was in trouble prior to the ACA. And we have now uh, a lot of talk about uh, further government takeover of healthcare. And I want to share that, that it doesn't have to be a binary choice. It doesn't have to be what we have today and a double down on that or the way that it used to be. You know, the great thing about being, being American is that you know, we can envision a future that can be new. We can create a new paradigm. Now, there are a lot of organizations that don't want that to happen because it's very profitable for this complex system to remain as it is. But DPC, direct primary care, and some of the, the other uh, uh, initiatives and, and uh, innovations that uh, we're discussing are looking to make a difference, to allow for a system that runs alongside the current one in the hopes that we can uh, compel them to, to compete and make healthcare more affordable and more accessible. I hope that uh, you'll join us um, on our, by, by joining our newsletter and learning about what we're doing, when we're doing it, and the research that we're putting out. Uh, but uh, we have really appreciated uh, all of you giving your time today to listen to us. Uh, this is something that we were going to be uh, very involved in over uh, the next several years. So uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out to us here at the foundation. Thank you all very much.